Hello and welcome. I am the Armchair Audiophile, and today we're going to be talking about the Tin Hi-Fi P1. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you already know what these headphones are, because they may be the most hyped IEM release of the year thus far. Um, but for those of you who don't, the Tin Hi-Fi P1 are special because they utilize a 10 millimeter planar magnetic driver as opposed to a normal dynamic balanced armature or hybrid driver configuration like you'd find in almost any other IEM on the market. Um, generally speaking, planar magnetic technology has been limited to full-size headphones if you don't count um, experiments from things like the Odyssey iSign series and the Unique Melody ME1, both of which were open back designs, so not very practical as an IEM. Uh, they both required significant and funky looking EQ to sound right, and uh, you know, we're really first generation early adopter experiments with the tech. This, however, is something new. Um, with that said, let's talk about 10 Hi Fi for a second. They've had huge success in the past two years or so with the T2, T2 Pro, and the T3. All three of those sets have come to define segment leading value per dollar at their respective price points. And with this new planar magnetic flagship, they're trying to do the same thing for the $170 to $200 price tier. And today, we're going to see if they pulled it off. Let's start with build quality. The earpieces themselves, I can't find fault with. Um, let's see if I can get a better shot here for you. But they're uniform, smooth, well-finished. Um, elegantly designed and I think because of the design of the driver itself they're able to be very thin and tapered which results in them sitting deep in your conca bowl and not hanging far enough out to um, cause any sort of movement issues when you're moving your head they stay very well seated once they're in there the smooth edges result in no noticeable um, contact or irritation points, at least in my ears. Um, I am blessed with fairly average ears and can usually get a good seal with stock medium-sized tips. Um, rarely have issues getting an IEM to fit, period, but these are noticeably deeper, smoother, and more comfortable um, than a lot of the sets I own. The cable, on the other hand, is a more complicated affair. I have the stock cable over here. Right now they're on the ALO Audio Pure Silver Litz cable. But the stock cable has the worst joke of a weave I have ever seen. It is loose, non-uniform, and feels delicate like it could fall apart at any second. Um, don't get me wrong, the wire they used appears to be of good condition. It's soft, it's not janky, it doesn't readily tangle, which is nice, but there's so little of it that it comes off looking a little hackish. Now, I understand this is $170 for a planar magnetic headphone, which in this form factor with the finish quality of the earpieces yeah, leaves some room for me to forgive, but Let's talk about the case and what I think they could have done differently here. The case is beautiful. I mean, it's a faux leather of some kind, tin hi-fi logo on it, magnetic snap top, um, fits the headphones okay. The problem with this is that it has no affirmative latch. So if you throw it in a backpack, it can just launch your headphones off to do whatever and it's really too big and ungainly for a pocket so it's ultimately useless despite being very attractive and um, increasing the wow factor when you open the package for the first time. Uh, it's just me but what I would have liked to see is them go with a cheaper EVA style clamshell hard case with a zipper and use the money saved to buy a few extra inches of wire to tighten They might as well not have cable weave. Um, what else is there to say about that? The cables do have decent connectors. The three and a half millimeter is a nice and weighty affair with faux carbon fiber like we've come to expect really from Chi-Fi IEMs at this point. The Y split is a nice metal piece, tin Hi-Fi logo screen printed or etched on. Weird clear bead as a 
chin slider, and then these preformed, oh, let's get that in frame, preformed plastic ear hooks as you approach the MMCX connectors, which do seat with a satisfying click and remain tightly seated on the ear pieces. So it's, it's not like they cheaped out all the way through, it's just the weave. The weave is very sad. Um, but with that said, let's talk about sound, because that's what's really important with this set, and that's what's really exciting. Um, for sound testing, I spent about a week listening to these casually and taking brief notes. Um, then I did a second pass of the same tracks on my desktop rig to see if those observations held true over time and between different source gear. Um, for the casual testing, I ran the P1s mostly from my KNN5 Mark II here, as you can see, just to get hyped up for the review, listening to a little bit of Electric Wizard. Um, pure joy on these. Um, sometimes I ran straight from the i5 X can we have here, um, and we'll talk about more later. A um, little bit of testing with the Ear Studio, Radzone Ear Studio ES100. Um, that comparison is to address a question from a HeadFi member. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later in the video. And for my desktop critical pass, I use a Project Audio Prebox S2 Digital feeding an IFI Micro ICANN Special Edition. The Prebox S2 Digital is a dual mono, dual ESS9038 implementation, and the Micro ICANN Special Edition is capable of 4 watts per channel at 16 ohms. It is a juggernaut. I have yet to find a headphone it can't power. Um, both units are being run on IFI, iPower, low noise power supplies, which are themselves plugged into a Furman Power Station 8 linear power conditioner. So I can assure you, these are getting very clean power and any distortion I'm going to hear is coming from some other source in the signal chain. Um, finally, I'm using FUBAR 2000 with Project's own Wasapi driver package to ensure that the DAC adjusts its output mode to match the bitrate of the file being played to avoid any sort of up or down sampling artifacts. Um, now, the sound of these is really special. The overall signature of the P1 is mid-forward with extended highs, bass and mid bass that I would call just slightly north of audio of uh, studio tuned and significantly rolled off sub bass which while still tight still present I would call inaccurately recessed um, that being the case the P1 really tends to shine with music that relies less on sub bass stuff like America you know uh, the Rolling Stones Fleetwood Mac Herbie Hancock Oscar Peterson um, you know, even if you're into sort of, uh, you know, folk music, classical, Yo-Yo Ma, Silk Road Ensemble sounds incredible on this. Um, but I mean, even Electric Wizard still sounds good. It's not like there's so little sub bass that you can't listen to whole genres. You just have to know what you're getting into. For example, on the hip hop tracks I tested, BFK by Freddie Gibbs, Window Pain by J. Cole, all I Know by The Weeknd and Future, not really a rap song, but and a few tracks off the new JPEG Mafia album, shout out Peggy. Um, the P1 did an excellent job of reproducing all the minute details and complex beats, all the percussion, the treble activity was excellent, but the sub bass roll off keeps the P1 from being truly a hip hop heads headphone unless you want to run EQ or bass boost at all times. Now, let's talk about notable strengths. The primary notable strength here is the notable strength that comes with any planar magnetic headphone, and that's going to be speed, detail retrieval, instrument separation, uh, bass tightness, and the way that the dynamic range is expressed. On a dynamic driver earphone, I'll find that if something's going on in the highs, mids, or lows that's particularly elevated versus something quieter going on in a different segment of the frequency range, it can be overwhelmed. The driver has trouble reproducing both um, at the same time. Planar magnetics don't seem to exhibit this problem until you get far higher into the complexity. Um, and I have some specific examples as we get a little bit further in. Um, 
For example, um, Michael Jackson's PYT. In the middle of the verses, there's this electric piano chord mixed pretty low in the left channel that hits off beat and it's perfectly audible despite all kinds of activity going on from the bass synth and the vocals, things that would really overwhelm that little detail. You know, like on a single BAIEM like the Campfire Comet, the vocals would probably be standing on top of that chord and you'd have to really look for it. On the P1s, it just sort of gently says hello from across the cafe. Um, the track U by McGee, it's spelled M-K period G-E-E. Not a well-known track, but one you should definitely check out on Bandcamp. It's really snappy and funky with a lot of tightly spaced percussive rhythms and a thick walking bass line that together can trip up a slower driver. But the P1 stays effortlessly composed and maintains instrument separation flawlessly. Um, and finally, the general performance with mids and treble in modern hip hop. I know I just got done saying this isn't a hip hop heads headphone, but to the extent that you are interested in beat production and you really want to hear every decision that a producer made, um, or you really want to hear every lyric that a rapper is performing, um, these are great. I mean, the mids and treble in modern hip hop are perfect on these. You're just going to have to run some sort of EQ for the sub bass. Um, but otherwise, I would still consider that a strength. Um, second, these have really natural timbre, even among planars. Um, and by that, I mean the tone of voices and instruments and how close to lifelike or real they sound. Um, on Mary Jane's Last Dance by Tom Petty and Punta del Sol from Lee Rittenauer's 2012 record Rhythm Sessions, the guitar attack and decay is perfect. They sound rich and lively, overall extremely pleasing. On uh, Herbie Hancock's version of the Gershwin Standard, it ain't necessarily so. Uh, the trumpet could be live. I mean, it's right there. It's got all the flair and intensity you'd expect from a live brass instrument, but without sounding thin or peaky or honky like they do on, for example, I have an old set of New Force Primo 8s um, that I run on a Bluetooth cable at this point, but uh, those never did well with trumpets. They sounded really honky and peaky. Um, the same was true with the LZA4. While that was overall a really good IEM, um, there was something grainy going on in the upper mids that with trumpets or saxophones really stuck out and uh, kind of ruined it a little bit and ended up causing me to move on from those particular headphones. Um, on Fleetwood Mac's Dreams, the uh, big cymbal crash leading into the chorus, absolutely perfect. It's not splashy, it's not peaky, the decay is perfect. Um, it's just natural you know, to beat the word to death. Um, final key strength here, solo vocals and vocal harmonies. On the live version of June Hymn by the Decemberists, um, the harmony between the male and female vocalists during this sort of dramatic build towards the end of the track is just pristine. Um, well, we talk, I'll talk about that again in some of the gear comparisons, but that really impressed me. Um, it's one of those things that I look for on any new headphone is how well I can separate out that particular track's vocal harmonies, and it is exquisite. Um, going back to Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, the stacked vocal harmonies all through that track um, really only usually easy for me to distinguish on gear that is higher end than this. Um, you know, I can do it on my Ether C flows. I could kind of pick it out on the HE400i, but on dynamic headphones, it, it can be tough. Um, that being said, I don't any you know I don't own anything really exceptional like any sort of ZMF stuff in the dynamic territory. But generally speaking, this is a real planar strength, and the P1 brings it to the in-ear form factor with a plum. Um, America, Tin Man. This is the clearest I've heard the vocals short of my Ether C flows. I mean that's. That's a bold statement. Those are $1,600 headphones. Um, I don't think the vocals come out that clear on my iSign 20s. Um, it's just um, the recording I have of that track is a wave rip I took off of their Greatest Hits CD. 
and uh, let's just say the P1 does it incredible justice. Um, try to speed through the last of these. REMs try not to breathe. Vocal reproduction on this track also punches well above the price point for IAMs. Reminds me of a well-amped HE400i with like wisps of Aeon flow closed. Um, you know, that's why I'm not gonna come out and say that these are little ether C flow killers in your ear holes because they don't always do that. I, I, I hire on the Tin Man because that was a very particular standout moment for these. Um, on other tracks, they don't always do that. Um, I will say on Washer by Slint off of uh, Spiderland, that male vocal is also pristine, uh, just excellent. But now that I have significantly fanboyed these, we can get into their notable weaknesses. These have a really narrow sound stage um you know i don't want to call out or talk uh shit on old zeos um i love his content uh, i met him at rmaf 2018 nice gracious dude but uh it is simply incorrect to say that these are wide because no matter how much amp i threw at these i could not get them to be wide now they're not so narrow that you get that restricted entirely in the head sound stage, but it's kind of like panels of sound about a half inch away from your ears. The sound field has plenty of height, um, but it's so narrow that it robs panning effects, like the intro to sea legs by the shins of their psychoacoustic impact. Um, same can be said for the approaching footsteps at the beginning of Yoshi Horikawa's Wandering. Um, on my Ethers or the iSign 20s or even the Mi Pinnacle P1, which you can get for $114 on Mass Drop all day long, um, this sounds distinctly like somebody getting closer to you. On the P1, the soundstage width is so restricted that it just sounds like footsteps slowly fading into the mix with no psychoacoustic sensation of distance or motion at all. It just gets louder. Um, it was kind of weird. I'd never heard that effect that bad before. Um, this narrowness also robs some live recordings of their ambiance, um, leaving tracks like Tyrone from Erica Badu's 1997 live album feeling less immersive. Um, however, the narrowness can sometimes be a slight positive in the very specific case of already narrow and intimate older jazz recordings. You know, Oscar Peterson's solo records, um, on the widest headphones still sound like they're right there because that's how it's mixed. Um, and that plays really well on these. Uh, it sounds great. Um, but overall, it's it's the main thing I can really, you know, ding these headphones on. Now, the second notable weakness is the sub bass roll off. I suspect that this would be the number one issue for a lot of people, but I prefer more studio tuning to begin with, and most of my amps have some kind of bass boost available. Um, P1s respond really well to EQ, so it's not a huge issue for me, um, but it does really impact the P1s performance with hip hop and electronic music. They have solid bass and mid bass slam, and it's all tight top to bottom, but the roll off in the sub bass is so dramatic that bass drops and beat transitions leave you feeling a bit unsatisfied. Um, Yoshi Horikawa's Wandering, again, suffers due to this flaw. Um, that track has two major parlor tricks, its perceived size and its spatial effects, and the depth of sub-bass impact when they do use the sparingly applied bass drum. The lack of meaningful sub-bass impact or soundstage renders this track flat and boring to listen to. Um, this can also leave deeper guitar notes or upright bass sounding thin. Um, as the subtle reverberations of the wood are lost. Um, but again, they respond very well to EQ, and I found that um, just a little bit of bass boost went a long way as far as filling out the low end weight. Um, final notable weakness is that they can be sibilant or peaky um, kind of randomly. Um, it isn't a consistent issue across all tracks, but over the course of my testing, I encountered some ugly peaks and sibilance in a few specific tracks, 
Um, coming back to BFK by Freddie Gibbs. I heard vocal grain and sibilance plus some peakiness in the hi-hats when I was playing from the single-ended output on the KN. Um, and a little bit less so on the desktop rig, but it was definitely still there. Um, when I went back and tested the same track on the Moondrop Kanos Pros, which we'll talk about in a second, um, I didn't hear that. So it's not in the mix, um, or it is, and the Kanos Pros are slow enough to uh, to mask it, but, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. On uh, Michael McDonald's, I keep forgetting. Vocals are fine, but the hi-hats sounded peaky, maybe a little smeared. Um same deal with the Conus Pro. I didn't hear that issue. Um, uh, also, the hi hat on Roxanne by the Police. Um, it, it usually is just hi hats in particular songs. Occasional instances of vocal grain. Um, with additional amping, it tends to improve. Um, maybe that's just me playing louder. Uh, you know, we're getting deep into psychoacoustic territory here, and I can't say for sure. Um, but I didn't find any consistent circumstance under which they behaved poorly. Um, so they're really just picky. Um, and that does play a role in who I recommend these for. Um, last thing to talk about in terms of pure sound with these before we can get into some comparisons and gear pairing is balanced operation as you can see i've got them on the alo audio pure silver lits balanced cable um this is the stock cable that comes with the campfire atlas uh, but terminated in two and a half millimeter trs um, Without spoiling the specific gear pairing segment, I can say that the primary benefits of running the P1s balanced is a meaningful improvement in sound stage width. Um, it doesn't get massive. Um, it doesn't even really get to where I want it to be, um, but it does give you a little bit of space to breathe. Um, it doesn't completely neuter panning effects anymore. Um, live recordings gain a little bit more of that live feel, and it starts to be more, more like a normal narrow headphone and not slabs of sound right outside of your head in the weird way that they do that single-ended. Um, otherwise, the improvements from running balanced really seem to come down to the fact that most devices offering both balanced or single-ended outputs deliver significantly more power via their balanced output. Um, this really became clear when I was testing the XCAN and the Radsonier Studio ES100 um, because switching from single-ended to balanced on the ES100 delivered significant gains in speed, clarity, bass response, and overall dynamic range, but switching from single-ended to balanced on the X-Can really only improved sound stage width. As I'll address in the gear pairing segment in a moment, this I suspect is due to the relatively weak single-ended single output of the ES100 versus the already kind of overkill single-ended output on the X-Can. Um, before we get to that, let's talk about the Kanos Pros for a minute. Moondrop Kanos Pros at 170 bucks. Well, I know they're not really making the Kanos Pros anymore, but the uh, Moondrop KXXS, the slightly improved successor to these, is still about 170 bucks, and uh, really a direct competitor here. It's Metal Shell. Um, they also use a sort of exotic driver arrangement. Um, it's a diamond-like carbon dynamic driver, which to the best of my knowledge first appeared less than two years ago in the $1,300 Campfire Atlas and has in the last like six months exploded into the Chi-Fi scene with the Moondrop Kanos, the TFC number no. three. Um, I think Ibeso is doing the ITO1S with an ADLC driver. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. I'm just going by straight memory on that. But um, that's why I thought the Moon Drop would be a relevant comparison. Similar price, exotic driver, different approach. It's still a traditional dynamic, um, and it's tuned very, very differently. Um, compared to the P1s, 
The Konos Pros have a distinctly Harman-esque tuning, meaning a slight dip in the mids, a warm but tasteful rise in the bass and mid bass, and highs that leave enough air to be pleasant before rolling off to avoid upper treble peakiness. They also have a wider sound stage without needing to run balanced, and more sub bass without needing EQ. Um, on Michael Jackson's PYT, this results in warmer, thicker presentation, which is sort of smoother and slightly slower than the P1s, with less aggressive attack and decay, um, and less fine detail retrieval. Vocals take a small step back, letting the bass line and treble elements grab more of your attention. Um, on BFK, Freddie Gibbs, the Kanos Pros avoid the sibilance and peaks that I heard on the P1 while delivering much more satisfying bass extension. However, treble detail and clarity noticeably lag behind the P1, and particularly bassy passages can start to bleed into the mid-range a little bit, causing recession and blur. Um, in contrast, the P1s are able to better keep the treble, mids, and bass separated regardless of the intensity or complexity of the sound going on in any particular region of the frequency range. Um, on Sea Legs by The Shins and Wandering by Yoshi Horikawa, the panning and spatial effects, which were completely neutered by the P1's restricted soundstage width, are psychoacoustically functional. Um, however, they lack the speed to easily distinguish individual percussive rhythm layers in the Yoshi Horikawa track versus the P1, or really, to be more fair, some other headphone that I'd rather listen to that track on because neither that or that really do that track justice. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, it really only sounds right occasionally. And when you do, it's Nirvana and all, but um, when it's wrong, it's like really, really wrong. Uh, let's talk about gear pairing. Uh, there has been much ado regarding how much power you need to drive the P1s to their dynamic potential. Um, I've seen reviews on Amazon lamenting the inability of an iPhone 7 to drive the P1s and members on HeadFi claiming that they're barely considerable as mobile headphones because they need desktop amp levels of power. Um, ultimately, the story is much less dramatic than that. I've found that the P1s do indeed require a source with about 150 milliwatts or so to not sound overtly loose. Um, they really start to shine around 250 milliwatts and they scale all the way until you reach about half a watt. Um, after that, things really roll off and improvements become extremely marginal. Um, I'll start talking about the KNN52. Um, this device gets a lot of flack, but I really enjoy it. I've had it for almost two years. It's been totally reliable. The sound signature is excellent. Um, I did my first pass listening on this device with the stock cable. It's 165 milliwatt, single-ended output. And on low gain from 55 to 75 out of 100 volume steps, P1s sound pretty good. Um, you know, that's how I kind of established that 150 milliwatt base number. Um, Switching over to the balanced cable, this is a 250 milliwatt balanced output, ALO audio pure silver lits cable, sound stage width increases, bass response improves meaningfully, um, and I do mean that in tightness. Um, it doesn't really get any deeper from running balanced, it just tightens up, bass and mid bass slam improves. Um, and I think that's just coming from the additional power and not really anything to do with running balanced. Um, Overall, the slightly warm signature of the N52 really nicely complements the P1's natural bass roll-off. They even each other out a little bit, um, not as far as you'd want to go, but it, it, to the extent that you don't like EQ and you're looking for pure gear synergy, this is a slightly warmed app, just slightly cold IEMs. Moving on to the iFi X-Can. Simply put, the X-Can drives the shit out of the P1's. If you don't mind spending almost twice what your headphones cost on your amp, then this right here is the way to go. Um, the single-ended output is 600 milliwatts, and on that, the P1s sound tighter, faster, and more dynamic than on either of the KN's outputs. Um, the balanced output is a full watt per channel. Soundstage width increases meaningfully. Um, didn't really notice any other changes. Um, leading me to the conclusion that the P1 stopped scaling around the 500 milliwatt mark in terms of detail. Um, 
Notably, the X-CAN has a colder, more neutral signature than the KN or the ES100, um, but the analog bass boost is really tastefully implemented and does a great job of beefing up the P1's low end when called upon. Now, the Radzone Ear Studio ES100 kind of let me down on this one. The single-ended output, if I recall correctly, um, is only capable of about 60 to 65 milliwatts, and it just doesn't have the juice for the P1s. Even in two times current mode, everything sounds loose and hazy with lazy attack and decay and compressed dynamic range. It's really, it's just not up to the task. It doesn't sound good. Um, if you switch over to the balanced output, it's roughly 150 milliwatts. Um, we get performance that starts to approach the single-ended output of the can. Um, it manages to play through Rolling Stones, Wild Horses without anything for me to complain about, but performance to tr from track to track isn't consistent. Um, you know, some sound really good, some sound like there's something missing, um, and that really suggests that the ES100, even on a balanced output, is right at the limit of what it can deliver in terms of current headroom for larger dynamic swings with this planar driver. Um, overall, I just wouldn't recommend this for the P1s. Um, it is, however, a great companion for the X-CAN. Um, quick sidebar, the X-CAN comes with a two and a half millimeter to two and a half millimeter interconnect and does have both single-ended and balanced inputs. The X-CAN, I mean the uh, ES100, has two DACs, and they're completely separate throughout their signal path to the balanced jack. So you can run this as a truly balanced LDAC source for the X-CAN, and it sounds a ton better than the Bluetooth system that's built into the X-CAN. It's, you know, supposedly aptX capable, but they're tight-lipped about what chip they use, and I can see why, because it's not very impressive, and that's totally fine, because it's 300 bucks, and it's a full watt per channel, and it fits in your pocket. For the desktop rig, I'll keep this brief, because four watts per channel desktop amp is obviously overkill for basically any IAM. P1s did sound best on the desktop rig. However, I'm not, I don't really think that the amp is responsible for that. Um, the Prebox S2 Digital, it's dual ESS and 9038 DACs, 15 volt power supply. It's always going to be a better DAC than the KN's single ESS 9018 and a 4 or 5 volt lithium battery, or even the dual AK4375As in the ES100. Um, so to that point, I think the improvements in sound quality moving from the mobile gear to the desktop gear um, is really about clarity rather than dynamics. The uh, dynamic performance of the headphone really didn't change. And um, I think what I'm hearing is just a significantly more expensive DAC in the desktop rig. Um, with all of this covered, we can talk about, do I recommend it and who is it for? All in, I think the 10 P1s are excellent headphones in a vacuum and even more impressive at their $170 price point. They achieve something very new in the market, bringing signature planar magnetic sound to a true closed back portable IEM that does not require extreme EQ to sound good or even right, like the I signs and the ME ones that I mentioned at the top of the video. Um, that being said, I do not recommend them if you're looking for one headphone to do it all for you. Um, they require at least a decent mid-fi DAP or an amplifier, which a casual consumer is not going to want to own um, or is not going to want to carry around every day. Um, these do occasionally exhibit some sibilance and peakiness on particular tracks. They lack enough sub bass to satisfy someone who prefers primarily hip-hop, electronic, or modern pop music. Um, so if you're that customer, I'd probably recommend something more like the TFZ number three or the Kanas, um, no, the Moondrop KXXS, um, bassier, um, more forgiving, um, less power required, um, just going to be an easier experience for a do-it-all headphone. Now, 
if you have a collection going and you're looking for something different from every other IAM you own, you're a hardcore audiophile willing to carry around a powerful DAP or a DAC amp stack, you're interested in getting your first taste of planar sound, or you're like me and just a huge hoe for all things planar, then I wholeheartedly recommend the Tin Hi-Fi P1 as the next headphone you don't need, but should definitely buy. With that, I'd like to invite you all to leave a comment letting me know what headphones you'd like to see reviewed on the channel, and to join me again next week for a review and giveaway of the KZZSX. That's it for me, the Armchair Audiophile, reminding you that life is too short for bad headphones.